Sure. Yeah. It's a long time. Robert, you're only on Cabernet Sauvignon and really recognize the, the potential it had here was uh, Diamond Creek, which is on Diamond Mountain. And so in 1972, you know, making only Cabernet Sauvignon is, was kind of a radical idea. Uh, probably up until the late 80s, Chardonnay in the Napa Valley was actually more, more sought after and more valuable as a, as a crop than Cabernet Sauvignon, believe it or not. So the other idea they had was uh, we're only going to age the wines in American oak, which uh, in 2020 sounds like a little bit of a radical idea, uh, but, but in 1972 actually was not that unusual. So a lot of the great wines of Napa Valley in the 50s and 60s were aged in American oak because at that point you really couldn't, you couldn't uh, get good French oak in, in California in the United States because the French Coopers really had not recognized the potential of the market yet. And so uh, in order to find solid quality barrels, uh, a lot of people were using um, actually whiskey casks. So they would soak them in soda ash and then they would... Uh, uh, in order to, to remove the char, they would dump them out and clean them out and, and age wine in them. Uh, so a lot of, you know, the, the, uh, the wines of Beaulieu and Inglenook, uh, Andre Chelichev was a very big fan of American oak. And so it actually it was not that unusual of an idea almost 50 years ago. You know, here in 2020, it is kind of a radical idea. We're one of only a couple wineries that I know of in, here in uh, California that's only using American oak. Um, and the third big idea they had was we're going to, we're going to age the wine, uh, before we release it. So we want to, uh, release the wine and have people take it home. I want, if I sell you a bottle of wine tonight, you should be able to take it home and really enjoy it tonight. It'll, it should age as well. Cause that's, that's the measure of a, a great wine. Uh, but you know, it, I don't want to sell you a bottle of wine and say, go home, put it in your cellar. Don't touch it. Don't look at it for, for 10 years. So they had a very visceral negative reaction to that concept. And so the way they figured out to do that was, was really to uh, do a lot of the aging ourselves. So we're still on this, this extended aging cycle where the wines spend two years in barrel and then uh, uh, 18 months to two years in bottles. So the wines that we're going to taste tonight are the uh, 2015 Alexander Valley, which is our current release, um, and the 2014 Napa Valley, which is uh, often in export markets we're about uh, a vintage behind. So. Uh, the current release is, is uh, 2015 Napa Valley, but we'll be tasting the 2014. Uh, I want to give you just a sense of geography if you're not familiar with California. Let's see here. So this is sort of a, a good snapshot of our operational um, uh, footprint. So you can see on the right, that's the Napa Valley at the, the south end. It sort of opens up to the San Pablo Bay, which is... Um, uh, part of the, the bay system off of the Pacific Ocean near the San Francisco Bay. And then uh, to the left, we see Sonoma County. So Alexander Valley, you can see it's sort of a, it's a smaller, more narrow valley at the northern part of Sonoma County. What you can't see in this map is uh, the Mayacamas Mountain Range, which is sort of the mountain range that defines that border. So if you, if you draw a line more or less um, southeast from from Alexander Valley, this, this little border here is actually a mountain range, and, and uh, that's called the Mayacamas Range. So Alexander Valley is, is quite literally one mountain range closer to the Pacific Ocean over here. Um, so it's a little bit cooler of a climate. Down here in uh, the bottom part of Sonoma County, this is what we call the Petaluma Gap. So there's, a, there's an opening in the coast range here to the Pacific Ocean, and this is kind of what, a big influence of, of fog and, and maritime weather that comes into the into Sonoma County proper. Uh, and generally during the day as the interior over here warms up, uh, the fog will move in, it'll kind of make its way up uh, through Sonoma County and parts of Alexander Valley get kind of socked in. You can see up here, it goes to the border of Mendocino County. Uh, and the further north you get, the less fog influence you have. So Napa Valley with this mountain range here, the Mayacamas range, most of our, our maritime influence comes from the bay which is a much smaller body of water. And so it's a, a, a slightly warmer climate really in Napa Valley. And I think the wines really will show that. Um, just wanted to give you a few, a few beauty shots of where we're working. So uh, at this point, yeah. we're, we're most estate. Uh, in Napa Valley, we're probably 80% estate. In, in Alexander Valley, we're, we're about 65% and, and climbing slowly. Uh, the family's been on a, on a really concentrated effort to, to uh, acquire vineyards and, and shore up supply. And so uh, I think in the next probably five to 10 years, we'll be essentially a state for Silver Oak. So 
This is our main estate vineyard here. This is called the Soda Canyon Ranch. Uh, and this is in kind of the southern part of Napa Valley. This is the Soda Canyon Ranch uh, down here. Um, and so it's, it's um, uh, a little bit kind of in no man's land. It's a little bit too far east to be part of the Oak Knoll District, a little too far south to be part of Stag's Leap, too far north to be part of Coombsville, and, and uh, too low. This is, this is the Atlas Peak District up here. Um, and so we're too low to be Atlas Peak. So it's kind of in no man's land as far as sub ABAs go. But as you can see, the topography is rolling. This is kind of in the back of Foothill uh, Mountain Range, um, maybe about 450, 500 feet elevation. And so a very interesting place to grow grapes. And it gives us a lot to work with. It's about 110 acres, so more or less 50 hectares. Uh, a lot of different Bordeaux varieties planted here. We have actually all five planted here. And this is this is the main source of Silver Oak Napa Valley, as well as a few other wines that we make. <clears throat> this is a smaller vineyard in the Atlas Peak AVA. So really, if you're, if you're looking at, uh, at Atlas Peak from Soda Canyon, this vineyard is more or less right about here. This is called Jump Rock. This is a smaller vineyard uh, in, in the mountains. Uh, Atlas Peak is about 1,500 feet in elevation. So it's a, a mountainous region. It's uh, quite a bit later as far as phenology and harvest states. Um, and uh, really offers a lot of muscle to the blend. So it's definitely a, a mountainous wine uh, that brings a lot of, of power. Uh, in Alexander Valley, we have a couple critical estate vineyards. Uh, this is the Miraval vineyard here. This is about 80 acres or 35-ish or, uh, hectares, I guess. And this has been the, the uh, source of Silver Oak Alexander Valley for, for many, many years. Uh, since We've owned this vineyard since the late 80s. And so it's been a critical part of the blend since then. And this is our newest property, one of our newest properties here. This is where we just built a brand new winery in Alexander Valley. We call it the Alexander Valley. Um, and so there's a, there's a, a, a lot of different um, uh, parts of terroir to Alexander Valley and Napa Valley. You know, the, the climate, the influence of the Pacific Ocean is a big part of it. Uh, Alexander Valley generally will show a little bit more cool climate as far as Cabernet goes. Uh, so it's a little bit more acidity driven, the pH is lower, uh, the red fruits will show up a little bit more. Um, Nate, on that question, when I was doing some research before tonight, the, uh, the altitude, the average altitude of your Alexander vines are 200 to 250 feet. What yeah. are they in Napa? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find that, that reference in terms of... Uh, it's, it's a bit higher. So, you know, interestingly... Yeah. Being in Napa, where it's a slightly warmer climate, um, you can it's it's easier to ripen grapes at altitude. Right. So in Alexander Valley, we're quite cautious about altitude. We okay. think that there is an upper level of of uh, altitude across which we don't really want to go. So we'll, okay. so I would say and average in Napa Valley is probably about 600, 700 feet. And in terms of water, uh, the Macayamas Range clearly is beneficial uh, with cloud cover and, and, and natural uh, rain, I would imagine, for Alexander. But in terms of Napa, does the fog make up for the, lack, the relatively lower rainfall? Does it actually bring the, the moisture to a, a similar kind of level? Or the, is still not the average precipitation for both is pretty similar yeah. in about three feet per year, okay. uh, more or less. Um, it, you know, the fascinating part, one of the beauties of winemaking and terroir and this concept of, of sites being different is that that can vary quite a bit, even throughout the Napa Valley. You know, the, the, the driest region of Napa Valley is Carneros, believe it or not, which is the closest to the bay. Right. Uh, and they get about 20 to 24 inches of rain a year. Right. And some of the, um, some of the mountainous regions of Napa Valley, like Mount Beter, they can get quite, you know, close to 50 to 60 in an average year. And so it's a, there's a Big huge difference. Eh? That's amazing. Um, but but uh, uh, generally, you know, the, the, the fog layer doesn't really bring us that much precipitation. There are parts of California that we work in, like Santa Maria Valley, where uh, the fog is a huge part of the, the actual water status of the vines. Yeah. I think in, in uh, Napa Valley and Alexander Valley, the, the fog really just helps mediate the temperature. Oh, okay. In, in Stellenbosch and uh, the Western Cape, there's parts, uh, there, there's vineyards that are deeply reliant on uh, the water from there. And I would imagine parts of Portugal and Spain as well. Um, the, the maritime influences, uh, it's all they got really in terms of, yeah. in terms of access to water. Um, you know, so, uh, 
geologically, uh, because of our, our sort of varied geology in this part of California, uh, mm -hmm. groundwater is actually quite reliable. And so groundwater is, is, um, is really our, our main source of water, as okay. well as, so we don't, we don't really need to rely on surface water um, uh, or things like precipitation for, okay. for so maybe we should have a look at the Alexander first and then uh, then the Napa second, if that's okay yeah, with it. everybody. <laughs> you got it. So the Alexander Valley is a 2015 wine. Um, 2015 in California was a, um, a quite a memorable vintage for, for one particular reason. One was, and that reason was it was a very small, small, low yielding vintage. So we had, um, Number one, we had a, a low amount of fruitfulness from the 2014 vintage for, for whatever reason. Uh, so the cluster counts uh, going into the, the bloom season was already quite low. Mm -hmm. And then we had a, a lot of really poor weather during bloom. Um, so we had a lot of what we call shatter or, or lack of fertilization. And so I, it was a, a vintage that was probably about 40% smaller than a typical, typical average yield. It's interesting there. because there's no, they often say when, the, when it's a, a, a much lower yield like that, you're going to get far more in, intense fruit components. Um, there's, it, it, certainly for me on the, on the first sip of this, I've had it open for an hour. Um, I don't know how I didn't get into it earlier, <laughs> but it's been sitting in front of me for an hour. Uh, the overall, the, the first thing that seems to rise up for me is this bright acidity um, to the wine. But um, you're not getting any kind of overt ripeness from the fruit. Um, it's kind of poised and balanced, you know, so often in a super hot year with super low yields, you're getting this sort of smack across the chops of, super, of really, really ripe fruit. And you, you're not seeing that here. It's just poised and in sync and where it needs to be. It's really beautiful. Well, you know, um, the, 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 um, the, acidity, the acidity and the pH that you know, <clears throat> excuse me, is... One of the critical things I think for the Alexander Valley to age, uh, and the Alexander Valley is a really, really consistently um, uh, good shower throughout the, the years. Mm -hmm. So we go back and we taste all the wines over the years. Typically, we'll we'll go through the Alexander Valley, and each one will just basically taste a year older than the rest. And I think the pH is a big part of that. Um, in a year like 2015, um, you know, when it's uh, we're in the we were in the middle of this historic drought in California. Uh, that didn't break until the end of 2016. And so we were seeing a lot of aggregate effects of this droughts. That, that was probably part of the low yields. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very warm year. So, so we knew going into the harvest season that extraction was going to be a very big uh, An issue. thing to pay attention to. Yeah. Uh, and really, you know, balance. Um, as far as um, wine and aging go, and I, I think this goes back to the founding of Silver Oak and this idea of uh, ready to drink upon release. Um, one that's out of balance when it's young. You know, we talk about tannin and the way that that plays into aging, but yeah. when a wine is unbalanced young, it's going to taste unbalanced when it's old. I'm, I'm a fairly big believer in that. <laughs> it's like making a wine that's really, really tannic and, and structured and, and astringent and drying. Um, it, when it's young, it, you know, it, it's not as though that's it's going to... It's not going to evolve into a thing of beauty later. Yeah. And it's interesting, you're mentioning the all-American oak uh, and if I've got my research right, you're eighty percent new, twenty percent old, um, in the Alexander. Is that for the uh, Napa Valley? Yeah. Uh, Alexander Valley, it's more like half and half. Okay. And with the um, oak, because what I was what I was going to say was I'm not getting uh, any kind of aggressive oak action um, on the on the on the palate at all. Um, it's 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 very very integrated. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, the guys that work at the Cooperage will be very happy to hear that. <laughs> That's been a big goal of ours. This is um, a few photos of our our Cooperage. So we're unusual in that we make our own barrels. We own the family owns a Cooperage in the that state of Missouri. Awesome. Sort the of only central. Time I've ever seen that before is in Rioja. Um, yeah. I remember, I think it might have been Mugalu that we that we visited. They have uh, a whole operation uh, where they where they do it themselves. And where yeah. you're sourcing the um, the oak from? Is it all Californian oak? No, actually, uh, you know, American white oak grows all over the all over the continent, really. And uh, one of the reasons the cooperage is in Missouri is we found that Missouri oak is is our preference. Mm -hmm. You know, the the trees have terroir kind of like grapevines do. 
and so the the starting out using American oak and and actually this cooperage was was the main cooperage for silver oak even going back almost 50 years and so um, the 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 oak and the wine style sort of evolved side by side and became fairly intertwined and so the the idea to invest in and, and purchase this cooperage was really about ensuring supply and, yeah, and, and quality yeah. Um, it's interesting for me because as a relative latecomer to the American wine scene and tasting American wines, I've always had this perception in my mind that there's a classic American Cabernet and then there's this new style American Cabernet. And um, I get a little scared of the new style stuff because there's so much oak and it's so overt and aggressive. Um, I remember a tasting I had with Stephen Helen some years back, which really was a come to Jesus moment when we, when we looked at, I think it was six Californian Cabernets that night. And um, the majority of them were what you would classify as old school Cabernets. So it was Heights, it was Montalena and all these, and, and, and old vintages. And it just blew me away after having exposed exposure to the rock star ones. I won't name them. We all, we all know who they are. Um, the sort of super high rated uh, incredibly extracted uh, forward wines, um, which really left me a little stunned. Uh, and tasting these these kinds of wines where there's consideration given to the, the question of balance and making something in a style uh, that, that's a continuance through the ages is really impressive. Um, obviously, there's, for me today, tonight, there's, I'm, I'm tasting the tannic structure, but um, that's something that's already well evolved after five years mm -hmm. and super confident that in another two years, uh, it's, it's going to be a thing of, of, of beauty. That's for sure. It's really fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. We're, we, we, uh, it's a, it's a goal of ours certainly to, to, um, balance that structure. I think the, the American Oak also, also, um, contributes to that in a positive way in the sense mm -hmm. that, it does tend to be lower in, in elagitanins. We've, we've uh, done that research and found that that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it provides a lot of uh, uh, body, you know, it's got the vanilla, got the coconut aromas, yeah. uh, but also adds a lot of sweetness to the, the palate without adding a lot of structure, which uh, I think is- And when you talk about 50% uh, used oak, do you have generation uh, generations that you split down? Very often you'll, you'll find, you know, uh, second year, third and fourth year, do you, do you actually have a matrix that you work with or is it driven by vintage, your use of the old oak? The, uh, generally the old oak will be once filled barrels. So, okay. so right. once, they, once they get filled, they're, they've been full for two years. Okay, uh, got it. We do, we do, we'll play with the percentages of new versus used you know, in, a, in a slight way um, from year to year depending on the vintage. Uh, but generally between 45 and 55, it's, it's uh, very easy to just say half and half, but it, yeah. it'll vary just a touch. Yeah. So as we sort of work our way now to the, to the Napa, could you maybe give us in a, on an envelope, back of an envelope, the vintage differences between 15 and 14? Yeah, absolutely. You know, they were both, both drought vintages. Um, you know, the, the, the hallmark of 15 was those, those really, really low yields and, and uh, very hot summer. Uh, 2014 was also a drought year. You know, it's, it's been a really interesting period and we're, we seem to be going back into some sort of drought conditions here now. Uh, we had a winter this year that was really, really low precipitation and uh, actually had a February where we didn't get a single drop of rain, which was uh, definitely the first time I can remember that. Uh, but 14 and 15, a lot of these vintages uh, during this mega drought, this, this historic drought that we had, uh, we would start to get really, really worried as the winter was coming to a close and then get sort of this miraculous rainfall that would, that would recharge the soils right around the time that the buds would break. Mm -hmm. uh, and we, would, we would often start the year at, at field capacity, which means the, the soil is essentially saturated and has all the water it can hold. Uh, which is which is really critical to to wine quality and, and yields for sure. Uh, 2014 was a little bit more forgiving than 2015 as far as the extreme conditions go. The summer was not quite as hot, right? Uh, but it was. Uh, I, I want to say that was the driest and warmest winter of the whole entire period. Uh, there were uh, vineyards we work with in in uh, different parts of the state 
um, that broke buds so early in 2014 that we barely made it out of July. I think our first yeah. day of August was yeah. August 2nd or August 4th that year, mm -hmm. uh, which was really, really unusual. So going into this, into the, into the, the Napa cab, um, there's a, a certain softness a quietness about the wine, which is really uh, quite interesting. And I'm so delighted that we had Alexander first because you're definitely seeing a, a different kind of story coming out of coming out of the Napa vines. Um, is that a, it's can't only be a function of being a year older. It, it obviously is a completely different matrix. Um, the no, I think that's very that's very consistent for the two different wine styles and the the different growing regions. You know, mm -hmm. Alexander Valley is a, a, a slightly cooler climate, which you know, as you as you pointed out, leads to a lot more acidity. To me, the structure sticks out a little bit more. It's sort yep. of a elbows, yeah, yep. more tactile. It's got the elbows out, yeah. Um, and part of that is the blending as well. So so Alexander Valley is is typically ninety five percent or more Cabernet Sauvignon mm -hmm. for. 40 vintages, it was 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, the Napa Valley is more of a Bordeaux blend, and I showed you the picture of Soda Canyon Ranch, which is our main estate vineyard, the, right. the, the vineyard we own. And we grow all five Bordeaux varieties there, and so we have a lot of Merlot to work with. We have Cabernet Franc, we have Petit Verdot. And so the Napa Valley will typically be in the 75 to 80% Cabernet Sauvignon range. Uh, mm -hmm. Here in, in the United States, you have to be 75% varietal to, to put the varietal on the Yep. On the lake. Um, so that's that's definitely a big part of it. But I think you know the the Napa climate, the Napa soils uh, being a little bit warmer. Uh, to me, the Napa Valley always shows a little bit richer, a little bit denser. Uh, the the structure is always more seamless and and uh, uh, kind of no, nothing really sticks out in any way. And that's yeah. So, there's this kind of easy silkiness about the wine, and yeah, really yeah. really integrated um, characteristic to the wine, which is wonderful. It's it's this kind of style that makes me think of those the Montalinas and the and, and the Heights and stuff where you can just fall back and know you know what's coming. It's really just wonderful. Uh, it's delicious. Yeah, you know, one thing that people love about Silver Oak, the, the fans that we have, is consistency. So yep. we're very consistent vintage to vintage. Uh, the wine style and the, the wine goals, honestly. So it, I'm as a winemaker, I have the luxury of an owner that doesn't really care about critical acclaim. Uh, mm -hmm. you we kind of do what we do and we yeah. don't need to be externally validated to, to <laughs> people that we're doing the right thing. You yeah. know, our, our customers enjoying the wine is, is enough for us. Uh -huh. um, and so we don't need to make wines that will really stand out in the setting of, of uh, uh, you know, a, a critics sitting down to score wines and, sure. and take through a hundred wines in a few hours. So yeah. um, it's, one of it's the questions I wanted to ask you was, the mantle being passed down from Justin to Darren and to you, has there been a change in terms of style? Or maybe you've already answered this question before. Um, is this, if you were to look at Silver Oak as a body of work for the last 20 years, so, um, has there ever been a departure in the style of the wines? You know, we, we think that, um, I think, and I think Daniel would agree with me that, uh, wine making and wine blending really reflects personalities, so it's a very personal thing. Right. And so as as we're going through the process of blending the wines, um, you know the the decision making is slightly different, and and there has to be one person that has the ultimate say. As this is what we're going to do. You know, you, you uh, I used to work uh, for somebody who said, uh, you know, what 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 is a camel? And uh, the answer was, it's a horse designed by a committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you know, we feel very strongly that, that uh, there has to be one person that actually makes the ultimate decision. And, yeah. and that, has to be, that has to be something that comes from within. Yeah. And I think, you know, without a question, there's got to be slight stylistic differences. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would be here if we didn't see the wine world the same way. I think Daniel saw the wine world the same way Justin did and believed in the same things as far as wine quality that Justin did. Right. And I believe that with Daniel as well. I think that we, we were very, very different people. We couldn't uh, be more different. But yeah. I think we saw wine quality and, and uh, wine integrity the same way. Just uh, going back a second and third time to the Napa, what's the Napa cab, I'm really loving the soft brown spice. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, not, it's not giving the 
the, the same flavor profile as a French oak uh, would, would, would do uh, at all. Um, there's a beautiful sort of undulating component to the palette of this brown spice that's classically yours. It's really, it's really gorgeous. Um, mm. And um, you. if you were to consider cellaring this wine, what sort of time frame would you, would you give it? For me, um, you know, Silver Oak kind of hits its stride at about 15 to 20 from vintage, 15 to 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, of course, cellaring and, and, and wine preferences is a very personal thing as sure. well. Um, uh, you know, I, I typically start to think that they're actually showing well after about 10 years. You know, we're, we're always five years out from vintage, and sometimes even that seems too early, yeah. uh, to me at least. Um, but at about 20 years, um, you know, you're starting to get into the, some of those secondary characteristics, not quite into the tertiary part. Um, it, you know, the, the fruit is maybe faded, but there's always a touch of it. The, the fruit becomes very nuanced at that point. Um, so for me, you know, like mid nineties to early two thousands right now are what's really singing mm -hmm. and, and stuff that's, you know, 2007 and, and younger is sort of in a, in between phase, I would say. Adolescent stage. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, some questions from, uh, some people who couldn't make it tonight. Uh, they noted that you've done some work at Craggy in New Zealand and, um, do you see any fundamental differences between New Zealand as a, as a winemaking culture and, and California? That was his question. Yeah, you know, um, the, the labor situation, I think, is very interesting as far as grape growing in New Zealand. So I think that they've been forced to be much more creative than we have over the years uh, here in, in California, North America. Uh, in that uh, they've had to find ways to mechanize and, and figure out what's really important in grape growing. Um, and I think I've, I've found that it's not always what you think is important. Uh, I think we kind of, we bring that curiosity to Silver Oak and Toomey and we're always trying to figure out ways to do things better. Um, as far as wine making, you know, it was, uh, it was a place I look back on so fondly because uh, in, in sort of a similar way, because they're so isolated and, and um, uh, there's only so many resources there, they had to be very, very independent in, in the way that they made wine. And, and it's something that I like to bring to our winemaking staff is, is being resourceful and resilient and finding ways to solve problems on your own. And in fact, just yesterday I was uh, walking through some refrigeration issues with one of our, our winemakers and, and really kind of encouraging her to be curious about how everything in the winery works. That's, that's what I learned in New Zealand. I was so green that I, I, I was not at a point where I could really talk about the finer points of winemaking with the, the mentor that I had there, mm -hmm. but he taught me the way to approach your, your work and what you do. And, and that was, he, you know, he understood every single thing in that winery and how it worked and, uh, when things were breaking down, which they, they, it's, that's sort of what harvest is all about is, yeah. is uh, problem solving. Cause yeah. uh, you know, we have a saying that the, the crush equipment only breaks during crush. <laughs> <It doesn't laughs> break. So, uh, you know, that's, that's really what I learned there. And I think that's the spirit of New Zealand winemaking in a lot of ways is, is uh, sort of going it alone and on your own and, and resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. If anyone has any questions they want to ask Nate, this would be a fairly good time. Because I'm sure his caffeine buzz is going to wear off pretty soon. <laughs> I, I, I mean, Alexander Valley doesn't get the raps that Napa does, but it's actually a, a very, very powerful zone. Is it as well known in America? I mean, it's relatively unknown internationally, but is it more well known in, in America? I, I would have to say, no, it's not. You know, Alexander Valley is, um, uh, in a lot of ways, it's, it's associated with our, our brand and a couple others that are really the, the, the flag bearers for Alexander Valley. And, and um, I often think consumers don't actually really know where Alexander Valley is. Um, they, cool, they that'll keep the price down. <laughs> I think that's great. <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's the fascinating thing is the, the price of grapes. Um, in Alexander Valley versus Napa Valley is it's a shocking difference. You, mm. know, you cross a, a man-made border from Napa County into Sonoma County and the price of grapes drops by by 67%. Yeah, that's uh, crazy. 
Yeah, we, we had the fortune to drive through there last year, but unfortunately, just after the fires. So did you get impacted overly by the fires? Uh, luckily, the winery not. We were right in the middle of the fire zone. So it was, it was a very scary time. We, had to, we have a winery in Healdsburg that we, we actually opened in 2017. So it's been open for uh, three vintages now, and two of those vintages, it's, it's been evacuated during the fire season. Uh, so it's not, not a great track record at this point. Uh, but practically, it was unaffected by the fires in terms of damage. We had a few vineyards that were damaged, uh, and we're still assessing kind of the, the amount of damage. You know, vines are kind of interesting in the sense that uh, during the dormant period, you can't really tell if they're alive or dead necessarily. Uh, you know, we can cut into them and make guesses. And uh, many of them started to grow again this spring. Uh, and we were very confident and feeling good about it. And then uh, all of a sudden you get into the summer and the, a little bit of water stress and they just collapse. So uh, we will have to do probably some redevelopment in, in a few of our vineyards to, to deal with that fire damage. Another yeah. question uh, right. somebody raised was, um, what are your thoughts, maybe I hate to be political, but what are your thoughts about the tariffs um, on uh, European wine into the States? And is that having an impact on uh, commercial consumption in the US? Are you starting to see that? You know, it's probably a better question for Vivian, but uh, you know, I think um, we're, we're uh, for wine consumption in general. You know, America is still a developing market for wine. And so anything that's gonna discourage wine consumption at all is, is in my opinion, bad. Mm. Uh, even if, you know, by, by a strict competition sense, um, uh, you know, tariffs uh, theoretically should be good for our business. I, I don't believe that, that is, that's the case. Do you have any comments on that? No, I sort of agree with you. Um, I'm, yeah, uh, the tariffs, I, I, I actually agree with Nate. The, uh, the tariffs on European wines are very unfortunate. I don't think it makes a huge difference to uh, the domestic consumption. Uh, consumption of domestic wines because um, those people the people who are drinking wine are wine lovers and they're going to want to source those wines from Europe regardless of the price mm. so they're still going to be there they're going to have to trade up a little bit unfortunately but um, I, I haven't seen a big damage yet well, it's interesting because we're in the middle of on premier season now and Discounts relative to 2018, I don't think it's just a function of the U.S. market, but uh, we're certainly about 20% uh, yeah. lower than the, eight, the 2018 releases in terms of on premier prices. So, of the prices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that might be a factor of global economics as well as you know, tariffs and what have you, but it's an interesting time. I would just... I would suspect that's the case. Is it's a it's a much bigger picture than uh, just just the U.S. tariffs and um, mm -hmm. yes. I think it was what, Mouton was thirty five percent lower than yep yep. There's yeah, still no mind charging two hundred pounds a bottle for the for the second growth. So I still sort of choke when they release these breathless prices. It really, is crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, you know it's it's a noteworthy definitely a noteworthy um, change mm. because I. I don't know that vintage variation describes it. Yeah, entirely. there's there's definitely been a macro decision taken uh, by the negotiants. Uh, there's no question. There was a very big um, hmm. tasting in uh, in France recently, but very restructured in this new normal we have, where pe five people came in at a time, did the the barrel tastings, and were sent away. Everything was cleansed and changed and sent off. Um, and it was interesting to note Chances Robinson's article just this evening, I think it was, where she mentioned that uh, uh, instead of people eating in the three Michelin star restaurants in Bordeaux, those restaurants are making food for people instead. So it's a whole different, uh, for workers and whatever. Uh, so it, it is a, certainly a whole different world in terms of that aspect, because right now there should be about 5,000 global buyers buzzing around Bordeaux, uh, tasting yes. and carrying on. <clears throat> Yeah. Any other questions from anybody before we yeah. say? Uh, if you are on here, can I ask you, Nate? I tried to find it. Uh, my little study here is a bit dark, but what is the uh, alcohol content of, uh, of the Alexander wine? I couldn't find it. 13.9. Uh, yeah, the, it's. 13.9, um, probably. 13.9. Oh. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, it, it'll be between that and I think the highest alcohol we've ever had in Alexander Valley was 14.2. And that'll be higher than the Napa? The Napa for me is giving less alcohol. Uh, generally not. Not, it'll, okay. It'll be less than, than Napa Valley. Right, um, okay. Those, those will run into the 14.5 range for us. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but again, you know, the, that's the fascinating thing about the wines and the way they take... Um, the way they take oak is different. The amount of heat that shows based on alcohol is different. And, and a lot of that has to do with just the, the, the density of, of the relative density of the two wines to mm -hmm. me. Anybody else with a question before we wrap it up? That's it. Uh, guys, thank you so much uh, for getting up early and being with us tonight. <laughs> it was, well, this morning, it was very good of you. For those of us in Singapore and Australia, uh, we're doing the Tumi Pinos from Russian River and Anderson Valley uh, on the 8th, on the 30th of July online with, uh, not with Nate, but Justin will be doing that. And we have Ovid, uh, the Ovid uh, 2016, we'll be tasting uh, on the 18th of July. So Vivian will be With Austin up Peterson, yeah. with their winemaker. So you've got three winemakers from us now. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you get your to meet time. the whole. Uh, you get to meet the whole. Duncan the whole family. team. It's fantastic. Yeah, the whole team. Exactly. <laughs> well, thanks thank again, you. guys. We'll be in touch. Well, thank you, Robert, for organizing this. Thank you, Caleb, as well. Who's our? Uh, yeah, thanks, Caleb. We we'll take and, it easy. Um, we'll see you thank soon. you, guys, and enjoy your wonderful evening in Singapore. Yeah, and first night of there to, freedom. To have also. a little chilly crap with you, and for <laughs> definitely you definitely today. <laughs> I w I'm missing my chili crab. So. <laughs> we'll do that when you're in town, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Appreciate guys. your time. Good night. Thank you, Nate, so much. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks.